portion of Scripture, and uh, my subject tonight is to, I think that Jesus Christ never had a fair trial in Herod, Herod's court before Pilate. I don't believe he had a fair trial. And I think in the next 45 minutes, let's give him a trial because he's in question again. And now, the, one of the main things that he's questioned on is his word. And I believe that word. So I, I'm going to read tonight from the most disputed spot in the scripture. And that's Mark, the 16th chapter. And now, if we was pledging allegiance to the flag or if we was uh, hearing the Star Spangled Banner, we'd all stand. And I think if we could do that in commemoration of our fine nation that we have, we surely ought to do it to the Word of God. So let us stand just a few moments while I read from the Word, Mark, 16th chapter of St. Mark, beginning with the ninth verse. Let us listen close as we read these verses. Now, we're right at the resurrection time. We're at the time where our Lord had just risen from the dead. And was appearing to the, in different forms to the people. Now the ninth verse begins like this. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first unto Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, Believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. And I'm going to ask, if it's all right, that if a brother, Marvin Smith, who was so kind to us yesterday and had me in the prayer line with him last night, if he'll ask God's blessings on the words that I've just read. Brother Smith. If you... Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight for thy word. We pray that you'll let your word run swiftly tonight. We pray that God, as thy servant proclaims thy truth, you'll give him heavenly boldness and power and authority Granted. to speak the word of God. Yes. Let his tongue be as the pen of a ready writer. Granted, Lord. Oh, God, as an ambassador of heaven, let him wield the sword of the Spirit. Grant it, Lord. The power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord. Open our hearts, God, to receive thy precious word. Yes, Lord. We pray that you'll quicken us and strengthen us through the preaching of the word tonight. Grant it, Lord. Make thy word a blessing to every listener for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So many of my friends here that I'd like to mention them all, but uh, just as Brother said, we don't have time to do it. Brother Outlaw there, a real bosom brother, friend of mine from Phoenix, and Brother Mosley, and, and so many different ones that I just can't hardly have time to recognize each one, but I'm sure you understand I don't want to pass you. Now, on this word, 
We are confronted tonight, and I just want to say a few things about this scripture. Everywhere we go, we find this the most diff, uh, uh, the, where the unbeliever picks on. Here, some time ago, many of you know Paris Reedhead. He's the president of the Sudan Missions. That's one of the largest uh, fundamental missions in the world. He and Don, um, I can't call his last name, he's a pastor of one of the big Baptist churches at Chattanooga. Came into my house in, uh, in Jeffersonville and said, Brother Branham said, we understand that you were Baptist. And I said, yes, sir. I was ordained a missionary Baptist church. He said, now here you're associated with the Pentecostals. I said, yes, sir. I'm one of them. And uh, he said, well, I want to ask something. So they claim to have the Holy Spirit. I said, uh, do you think that's the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, the only thing I can't understand, what all that screaming and shouting and carrying on like that? I said, well, uh, if you... If you can't put the steam to roll in the wheel, they blow it out the whistle. <laughs> that's all I said. It's, if they could, that's why I'm with them. I said, if you could only get that thing in operation and that the enthusiasm moving out under the winning souls, it conquer the world. But I said, that's why I'm there. He said, well, when I was a little boy, I said I had a call from God and Mother washed over a washboard to send me to school. I said I, when I thought I when I got my BA, I said I there I'd find Christ, but said I, I didn't. And said, now, Brother Branham, I've got enough degrees and honorary degrees to plaster your wall. And said, worse Christ than all of it. I said, I'm not the one, brother, with the grammar school education to say the, the teachers was wrong. But I said, they were right in what they said, but there wasn't, there's some more of it. And he said, here's why I'm here. He said, in the school, we educated a fine Indian boy from India. I think he learned to be a, I think it was... Uh, maybe a civil engineering or, or something he had, he had mastered in. He was going back to help his people. He said, I took him to the, to the boat or the train where he was to go catch the boat and he, to go back to India. And I said, son, while you're, while you're going back, he said, now you're all fit and got your education. Go back to your people. He said, why don't you take a real living God back and forget that dead prophet Muhammad that you worship, the boy being a Muhammadan. Well, he said, sir, he said, uh, what can your Jesus do for me any more than what my prophet can do? Well, he said, our, 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 our Jesus gives you life. Your prophet can't do it. He said, but he promised to do it. He said, um, you know what we Mohammeds are waiting for is to see you Christians do what your leader said you would do. He said, what's that? He said, well, you said, see, Mohammed only promised life after death. But said, Jesus promised that the things that he did, you do also. And he said, or oh, said, uh, well, he said, you see, they did do it. He said, they, we're talking about thee, thee now. And he said, well, now, sir, he said, uh, I tell you, he said, you've read the New Testament. He said, oh, many times, through and through. He said, for instance, what scripture are you referring to? Well, he said many places, John 14, 12 and so forth. He said, Mark 16, he said, well, now, he said, you see, Mark 16 said we learn that really some of the scriptures, that it's not authentic. He said, uh, uh, Mark 16 from the ninth verse on, he says, it's not found in uh, the oldest of manuscripts. He said, it's just added. Now, really, I wonder where you get that at, if there happens to be a critic near why, I've studied 20 years in Bible history. See? Certainly, Irenaeus and Polycarp and all of them recognized it. See, certainly. It certainly was added. The Vatican didn't add it. Certainly not. But this, these real writers said Jesus said this. Authentic writing. And so he said, from the ninth verse on, it's uh, not inspired. That Mohammed said, well then, Mr. Reedhead... What part is inspired then? He said, I want you to know that all the Koran's inspired. Not this part here and part there. What a defeat. So he said, well, um, he said, uh, uh, well, if, if it's not, if that part's not inspired, how do I know the rest of it's not inspired? Now there's a good, he said, well, he said, uh, when uh, Jesus raised up from the dead and Mohammed's in the grave, he said, has he raised up from the grave? He said, he said, if he did, he would be in you to the consummation. 
and the works that he did, you do also. And Mr. Reedhead uh, said to me, he said, uh, Brother Branham, I didn't know what to say. He said, well, Jesus did raise from the dead. He said, you've had 2,000 years to prove it. And 90% of the world hardly knows anything about it. He said, let Mohammed raise. And the whole world will know it in 24 hours. That's right. If you've been to his grave, some of you missionaries, every four hours he changed the guard of the horse there. White horse that he'll ride it down the world when he raises from the dead. But we don't have to wait for Jesus to raise from the dead. He's already raised from the dead. So he said, prove it. He promised it if you raised from the dead. So he said, well, how do you know? He said, Mr. Reed had said, he lives within my heart. And he said, and Mohammed lives within my heart. He said, Mr. Reedhead said, Mohammedan religion can produce just as much psychology as Christianity. He said, then I kicked the dust, Brother Branham, as a defeated Christian and promised myself that I'd come talk to you. Well, all that Bible's inspired. God watches over his word. God's got to judge the world someday. And if he's going to judge it by the church, what church will he judge it by? If he judge it by the Catholic Church, you Catholic would say so. Which Catholic Church then? The Greek Orthodox or Roman or which one? If you judge it by the Baptist, you Methodists are lost. If you judge it by the Methodist, you Baptists are lost. If you judge it by the Pentecost, you're both lost. See? He isn't going to judge it by any church. He's going to judge it by Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ is the Word. St. John, the first chapter said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Therefore, he'll judge it by Jesus Christ, and he is the Word. The Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God being infinite in the beginning, with his infinite wisdom, his knowledge, divided his gospel in each age. We find out that the churches get it all messed up. And then God sends his prophet on the scene and the word of the Lord comes to the prophet. How they know it is? It's a vindication of the, the message of that age. Now, when, what, when Moses came, as was promised that he would come, what if he come with Noah's message? It wouldn't have worked. Moses could not have built an ark for the saving of the people. The word of God that was promised for Moses' age was the word that had to be vindicated. In the age of every seer and every prophet, it's been the same. But we find the people living in a glare of another light. As Jesus said, you garnish the walls or the tombs of the prophets and you're the one that put them in there. See, they build up something over a message and live in that glare of that light and refuse to walk in the light that is of the day. That's what the reason they refused to know Jesus Christ when he came. That's why Jesus exhorted them, saying, Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. But they had got so many creeds and things and their traditions that Jesus said, You've made the word of God of no effect by your traditions. And that's the way it's been in every age. God will judge the world by Jesus Christ. And many times, you see what it is? We people try to have our own interpretation of the word. To say, Mark 16 from the ninth verse on is not inspired. Why is it inspired? God doesn't need any interpreter. He's his own interpreter. Amen. God does his own interpretation. And the Bible said it's of no private interpretation. God said at the beginning, let there be light. And there was light. That don't need interpretation. He said, a virgin shall conceive. And she did. I don't need any interpretation. She did it. Although when she did it, in the time that she did it, the people were so full of creed till they didn't understand it. It went right over the top of their heads. It did that in every time, and it'll do it again. Now, we find out that's right. The people does that. Christ and the church, we find in this day that we're living, is nothing different from any other day. Man, the church, is always praising God for what he done. And always saying what he's going to do. And ridiculing what he's doing. That's always been the history of the church and it's the same way tonight. It's because that man-made theories get into it and get it all mixed up. And when the true word speaks for itself, see, they're so full of creed till they are so blinded by that glare, they can't accept it. While the reason that the Lutherans 
at the Methodist, when you Methodist people, this fine Methodist boy here just sang a while ago, when that boy, the, what was the reason? See, the Lutherans were living in the glare of Luther. And that's the reason Methodist message didn't go over well. And when the Pentecostals come along, there's all living in the glare of Methodist until the Pentecostals come along. But you see, all this, if you just look into the Scripture, what's the church ages and what each one's to do, you'll find out right where we're living. We're living in this age. Now, upon the basis of this criticism, so much of the Word of God, I want to take this text tonight and call it a trial. Jesus didn't get a fair trial in the days of Herod, in the days of Pilate. But in this day... I want to see tonight in this little group of people, if you'll sit with me, I want to see that he gets a fair trial because he's still the Word. Amen. He's still the Word. How many agrees with that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and the Word's still God. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's see that he has a fair trial. Now, I'm going to make this like a courtroom. If you'll just suffer with me, I know it sounds kind of... Unusual, but we're just a little gathering here now that we want to bring this word which I claim is God's word. And I'm here to defend it. And now we're going to bring it to a court trial just exactly like it was in the days when Herod gave him a trial. Or Pilate, before Pilate's court. We're going to bring him for the court of uh, this Ramada room this 1964, April the 27th, 1964. Now, we're going to make this a court, and you are the judge and the jury. You court. I'll be the moderator. And we're going to make this like a court trial. And at the end, you make your decision. As any, as any jury has to make up its mind for the verdict. And then your action from hereafter will prove what your verdict is. No matter what you say now, your action will prove your verdict. Now, the case is to, today, friends, I'm going to act as a moderator, and, I, and they're like it was in a real court case, and give him a trial. If you'll bear with me for a few moments and pray for me. Now, the case is the Word of God versus the world. The world that doesn't believe it, and the case is the Word of God versus the world. The, uh, the cause for the indictment is breach of promise. That's the breach of promise is the cause for this case. And now, I understand that in a regular court trial, that the uh, prosecuting attorney always represents state. I think that's right. In this place, the prosecuting attorney uh, represents the world, and the prosecuting attorney is Satan. And he's representing the world in this court here this afternoon. And the defendant... Is God, His Word, because God is always the Word. And the defense witness is the Holy Spirit. And the prosecuting attorney's witness is Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, and Mr. Impatient. These three comes up as a witness for the prosecuting attorney, which is Satan that represents the world. Now, let's call this court to order. And now, let's call the prosecutor, let him call his first witness to the stand to testify against the Word. And now, listen close. Now, I might not be able in hurrying, trying to get this through in 30 or 40 minutes. I might run over the top of something. But if I do, may the Holy Spirit reveal it now as court is called to order. Remember, you are both judge and jury. And now the prosecutor calls his witness, first witness to the stand to testify. And he calls Mr. Unbeliever and he takes the stand to testify. And Mr. Unbeliever claims that all the word of God is, of God's promises is not true. That's his complaint. That God's word cannot be relied upon. All of it. Part of it's all right. But all of it, he claims that he is a believer. Mr. Unbeliever. But he claims he is a believer. And he says that all of God's word cannot be relied upon. It's not true. 
He claims that he visited a so-called uh, uh, Holy Ghost meeting where people were claiming Mark 16 to be the truth. And many people claimed that they had been healed when it, where it says in Mark 16, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And this man says that he claimed that he believed God he listened to this so-called Holy Ghost preacher and he, this Holy Ghost group that were giving all kinds of testimonies and he had been sick in his body and he had these people to lay hands upon him at this Holy Ghost meeting and that was two months ago and not one thing has happened yet. He's just as sick as he was the time that he had hands laid up on him. He hasn't changed one bit. He's just as sick as he was. Therefore, he says that God is not just to put such a scripture as that in the Bible when he isn't sufficient to back it up. It isn't right for Mark 16 to be in the Bible because it, he proves that God does not keep his word. And he wants to indict God for putting such a promise as that in his word. All right. We'll have him step down. And now we'll have Mr. Skeptic to come up next to testify. Mr. Skeptic takes the stand and he uh, says that he'll tell the truth. He claims that he is a believer and he said he had been sick for a long time. That it is the ill effects from a great disease that it had. And then he heard someone testify on the street of having a godly pastor. And this pastor of this church preached and said that James 5, 14, if there be any among you sick, let them call the elders of the church. Let them anoint them and all and pray over them. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. If they did any sin, it shall be forgiven them. Confess your faults one to another and pray one to another that your effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he said that he went up there as a believer. He wants to tell this court this. That I went up there with all sincerity. And I had this so-called godly pastor of this church. That many claim that when he anointed him with oil and prayed over him. And the pastor said himself that God answered that word. And that word of James 5.14 was true. And there was many testifying that it was true. But he went up and the pastor, godly man, anointed him with oil, according to James 5, 14, prayed over him. And that was been six months ago. And he hasn't had any results at all. He's just as sick as he was at the beginning. So Mr. Skeptic says that that uh, cannot be true. Mark 16 is not true and neither is, giant, is, is uh, James 5, 14. It is not true because if God fails to keep his word, if this be the word of God, then God fails to keep his word because with sincerity as a believer, he went and let the pastor that the others claim they were healed by anoint him and take him through the same motion that he did the others and six months ago and hasn't had one bit of results of any time. Therefore, he also wants to bring indictment against God for putting such rational promises in his word that he won't stand behind. Getting quite a case here, aren't we? Let him step down, Mr. Skeptic. Now the next witness is Mr. Impatient. He's a rascal. Now he's going to step up and he's going to give his testimony. And he takes the stand that one day while reading... Mark's gospel, the 11th chapter, not 16th now. The 11th chapter, the 22nd and 23rd verse, that it reads like this. If you say to this mountain, be moved, and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you have said shall come to pass, you can have what you've said. And when you pray, believe that you receive what you ask for, you shall have it. He said he's been lame and his feet walked on crutches. For about 25 years. And when reading this scripture. And had been taught by his, his pastor. That all scripture was given of God. And was inspired. Therefore. If he said to this mountain be moved. And don't doubt. But believe that what he said would come to pass. 
He could have what he said. And when he prayed to believe that he received what he asked for, it would be given to him. Now, he says he prayed and with all sincerity and said that he'd be able to lay his crutches down and walk away from that place. And he honestly, with all of his heart, he believed that what he had said was right. And he, uh, that was been almost five years ago. And he's just as lame as he ever was. Now, if God, then he says, would keep his word, then why don't he keep his word? Now, I'm only given three passages of scripture. There are three witnesses, but I'm going to let the prosecuting attorney call some more. Now, we'll let Mr. Unbeliever, he testified. Mr. Skeptic, he testified. Unbeliever testified, Mark 16. And Mr. Skeptic testified against John or James 5, 14. And uh, Mr. Impatience, he uh, testified against Mark 11, Jesus himself speaking. And Mark 11, 22 and 23, he testified against that. Now we're going to ask Mr. Impatience to step down. Now, as we've all somehow or other been in courts, now the prosecutor's got to nail down his case. So the prosecutor comes up to nail the case down. The one that represents, pardon me, the world, Satan. He takes the stand. So he claims to this court this afternoon or this evening, he wants the prosecutor, the devil, wants this court to understand that these men are believers. And that this word is actually written in the word, the word of God, so called, he says. That this is written. And he claims that it comes from different places in the scriptures. And these men are witnesses that it isn't so. And he wants to say to this court, the prosecutor does, that he wants this court to understand that God is not just to put such rational promises as that in the book for his believing children to accept. And then he's not able to take care of, vindicate what he promised he would do. And he has three witnesses here. And three witnesses is a confirmation, as we know in all scripture. And he has three witnesses from three different places in the scripture that God is not justified in placing such things as that in his word. So his dear children will look upon it and try to accept it and believe it like he said. And then God let him down coldly. Also, he, uh, he claims that these children with all sincerity is doing this. These people, and they are defeated. True believing children are defeated by the word of God, so called. That they claim these things because it's written in the book and somebody else injected them into it and it isn't the word of God. And the Bible cannot be trusted. For here's three different places and three testimonies to prove that it's wrong. Now he's nailing his case down. For... He, the prosecutor wants to appoint, uh, call the attention to this court that these men here accepted this word with sincerity, believing it was the word of God, and God has failed to honor their faith. Further, he wants to claim that they are believers because they say they're believers. Yet again, the prosecutor wants to turn, call, the attention to this court this afternoon. Yet God promises again in another place in the scripture that all things are possible to them that believe. And it's written. That's another case. All things, no matter what it is, all things are possible to them that believe and these men claim to be believers. I want the court to understand the prosecutor to stand now is nailing down the case. Yet again, he claims to be alive after his death. That Jesus claims to be alive after his death. And the prosecutor wants to ask this court. 
Have you seen him after he raised from the dead? Where's the nail scars in his hand? Where is the crown of thorns that was placed upon him? Where's the marks in his forehead? And where is he at if he's raised from the dead? And then again, he says in Hebrews 13, 8, that his word says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The prosecutor wants this court to remember that. Then that where is he if he is? He wants to see him. Again, he claims that it's not so. He claims that Luke 17, 23 is not so. He claims that Revelation 3 is not so. He claims that Mark 4 isn't so. He claims all these scriptures of his resurrection. That it's absolutely false. He wants to point that out, that it's false. And he also claims that both heavens and earth will pass away, but not one tittle or jot from his word will ever fail. And the prosecutor wants you to understand, court this afternoon, that he has witnesses here to prove that they're wrong. Now, he asks the court to consider this while we're thinking. Now, we ask the prosecutor now if he's finished nailing down his case, quoting the scriptures, claiming they're not right, witnesses that they're not right, that they're not inspired, there are nothing to them, they cannot be relied upon, they cannot be trusted, he's got witnesses to prove that they cannot be trusted. Now we got quite a case on hand. Now let's let the prosecutor and his witnesses step down. Now we will call the defense witness, which the defense witness has a right to testify to the de- or for the defendant. And now the defense witness, which is the Holy Spirit, let's have him step up and hear his testimony. The first thing now, as you've heard what the prosecutor has said, you've heard what he is a witness has said, you've heard the scriptures, you've heard them read, and here's the witnesses that they're not true. Now, the Holy Spirit, as I say, which is the defense witness, he's called. The first thing he wants to call the defense witness, Holy Spirit wants to call to this court's case, that the prosecutor is not interpreting the word right to you. He wants to call your attention to that this prosecutor that's giving you the interpretation of the word that's representing the world in unbelief is the same interpreter that Eve had at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He misinterpreted the word just a little bit. Now, I might stop here in the court just a moment to say this. If God caused all this sickness and sorrow and death upon the earth, if he had to do it because of his justice to keep his word, he cannot be just and not keep his word. He's got to keep his word to be just. It's becoming to his holiness. It's becoming to him. And if Eve, not just Satan did not, the prosecutor did not misinterpret the whole thing. He just misinterpreted a word or so. And it caused death to strike the whole earth. And every hospital, every siren ever rung, every, every death that ever died, every struggle, every man on the battlefield, every poor little sick afflicted baby and all was caused By disbelieving just one word of God's word. And if it caused all of this for disbelieving one word, how are you going to get back disbelieving one word? It's got to be something that God has to judge the world by, and that's Jesus Christ, the word. We must believe it all. Notice, he said that he, that these men has been listened to the wrong interpretation of the word. The prosecutor is uh, not interpreting it wrong. Is that is interpreting it wrong to you, just like he did to Eve. The promise is only to believers, not make believers. Skeptics are impatient people. It's only to believers. And the, let me say this. 
If there's anybody should know whether these fellows are believers or not, it should be the defense witness because he's a quickener of the word. He just like your body. Your body is a piece of flesh. But unless the spirit is in there to quicken that body, it's dead. And so is the word dead unless the Holy Spirit quickens that word. And if he's a quickener of the word, he should know whether these fellows really are believers or not. I think we've got a good defense witness. He should know whether it's right or not. Because he makes a good defense witness because he's a quickener of the word. Again, the defense witness wants to call the attention uh, of the word that's in question here that we have just read that the prosecutor is trying to get a case of indictment against the word. Uh, defense witness wants to call your attention that it never set any certain time for deliverance. He never said when, he just said they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He didn't say to jump up right then. The word doesn't say that. James 5, 14 said when you're anointed with oil, he said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and God shall raise them up. He didn't say to jump up right then. It didn't say Mark 16, didn't say they'll lay hands on the sick and there'll be a miracle performed. He just said they shall recover. They promised it. Now, see if it's been some of these unbelievers has been misinterpreting the word to you. Saying, well, this one is prayed for. Why didn't he get up? I was at the meeting. I never seen nothing happen. See that interpreter they got? See what they're listening to? The defense witness wants to show to this court this afternoon that the word didn't say they would jump up right then. He said they shall recover. That's what he promised. He never said any certain time. And that was only to believers. And the defense witness also wants to call to your attention here this afternoon in this court that the word of God is said by Jesus Christ to be a seed. And a seed can only grow when it falls into the fertile enough ground to quicken the seed. And if this seed falls into a ground and is fertile with faith, it's got to quicken it. But if there's nothing there, just like if you wanted a blood transfusion, you went to a turnip. Stuck a tube in yourself and in a turnip, how are you going to get any blood? There's no blood there. No more can the word of God ever be quickened in an unbeliever's heart or a skeptic. It's got to fall in a genuine faith that believes that heavens and earth will pass away, but that word shall never fail. Amen. Like Abraham, he called things which was not as though they were. Hope against hope. He believed God. Now we find that this defense witness wants to call this to the attention. That the word is a seed that a sower sowed. It's written in the scripture that the word is a seed and a seed must fall. And the scripture says, some did fall on stony ground and the birds of the air take it away. Some fell just long enough to get enough roots to spring up and the thorns and thistles choked it out. But some did go in good ground and it brought forth a hundredfold. He wants to call your attention to that. And he wants to say that if this word in this Holy Ghost meeting where people were having hands laid on, it only applies to believers. There's no promise in here but eternal separation from God to unbelievers. It's only to believers. Someone said to me not long ago, said, I don't care how much I don't believe. I said, certainly not. It's not for unbelievers. It's for believers. They that believe. Now, the defense witnesses, a defense witness rather, wishes to call a witness. He has a right to call witnesses too. So the defense witness wishes to call his first witness against this and for the word. We are going to call Noah to the platform this afternoon before this court to uh, give testimony for the defendant. Noah was just an ordinary farmer, but he was a prophet. And the word of the Lord comes to the prophets. The Bible said so. And Noah lived, wants to testify that he lived in a very scientific age, greater than the one we live in now. He lived in a time where they could build a pyramid, could build a sphinx, which we cannot do. We had the machinery to do it with. 
And Noah lived in a great time. And he lived in a scientific time. And then he says that the word of the Lord come to him after him being a vindicated prophet. That the word of the Lord come to him and said, prepare an ark for it's going to rain. And it had never rained in all the history of the world. Amen. And upon his testimony and his witness for God and said God told him so and all that was out of this ark would perish. And the scientists could shoot the moon in that day with their radar and so forth because Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, same kind of an age. He said that they could prove that there was no rain up there. And that Mr. Unbeliever here and Mr. Scoffer and Mr. Um, skeptic, that they constantly haunted at him and made fun of him for believing such a rational thing. They were claimed to be believers back there. But he said, God didn't say a thing like that, yet he was a prophet. And the word of the Lord come to him and told him to do it. And he went preparing an ark. He got ready and built the ark. After he had the ark completed and Mr. Skeptic and Mr. Impatient and those walking around the ark, you see, you say, did they live back there? Listen, God takes his man, but never his spirit. The spirit is up on Elijah, come up on Elisha and on down and on down. The spirit is up on Jesus, come up on the church and on and on. And the devil takes his man, but never the spirit. The same spirit, religious spirit. Exists right down like it's on the Pharisees. It's right here in Tucson, Arizona. Amen. Just as unbelieving and just as, uh, just as creedy and, and traditional as that was. Not only here in Tucson, it's world over. And so is the Holy Spirit. Just as real tonight as it was at any time. Jesus Christ. Notice, he wants to say that these people made fun of him. For being such a, 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 a delinquent person. That would have no more mind and no more intelligence than to believe that water would fall from where there is no water at and never had fell. But yet Noah said he held steady and believed that it would rain because God said so. He knew that God was able to do anything that he said he would do. Therefore, he built the ark. And after the ark was completed... He sat in the door of the ark. And they said, now, you fanatic, Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Scoffer, the defense witness or the uh, prosecutor's witnesses. He said, they passed by me. And they said, now your ark's built. Now you got your doors in it. And where is your rain? But it looked pretty bad, he said at times. But yet, I know that God was able to keep his word. He never said when it was going to rain. He said it would rain. That's all there was to it. He never said when it would rain. He just said it was going to rain. And I knew that it was going to rain because he had me to build the ark. And I set steady. And then we find out that on May the 10th, he went into the ark. One morning, and the door closed behind him. And no one could open it. Then, Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic, they walked around the ark and laughed at him and made fun of him and said, Now, you old fogey, you close that door. And I suppose you expect us to believe that something else closed it. We know your tricks. You're no more than a magician. And you're just one of these here kind of a guys that tries to play tricks and, and some kind of a hoax and you close the door. But he said, In the midst of all that, I was there. I seen the hand of God close the door. Amen. Then the first day we'll say, we'll see if it rains. First day it didn't rain. Second day it didn't rain. Third day it didn't rain. On till the seventh day. And I'd like to stop here on Noah's witness and let you know this, that there will become a time that when man and women, the church will be going right ahead preaching and believing they're getting saved when the door will be closed. Just like it was then. If you're not in, you get in now. Because God will close the door and there will be no more mercy. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Remember one time even the disciples said to Jesus, Why does the scribe say that Elias must first come? 
Them disciples, Jesus said, he's already come and you didn't know it. And they understood it was John the Baptist. They done been here on earth and done been beheaded and went up to glory. And the thing that they were looking for was already in the past. One of these days, men and women will cry out. Amen. Amen. Well, it be too far, be too late. The door will be closed. Jesus said it would be that way. The virgins come and knocked on the door and said, let us in. They want to get some of the oil, but they ought to have got oil when oil was being given out. They knocked on the door and said, we're cast into outer darkness where there'll be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. I'm only trying to make that little sideline of the defense to the court. Now, of the, of the word. Now, Noah said, but after a 120 years, one morning the clouds began to rise and the rain came. God promised it. He never said when it would happen. They thought it was going to happen that same week that he told me. And I had an idea it could happen that week. And I was sure when I got the ark uh, finished that it would happen, but it didn't happen. But I sat steady because God made the promise. He never said if just today it's going to rain. He said it would rain. So he, the witness steps down. Second witness comes up, which is Father Abraham. We'll call him. He said, oh, yes, I know that Mr. Scoffer here. I, I know Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Skeptic. Oh, that Mr. Impatience. I was a prophet also in my day. And the word of the Lord came to me and said, separate yourself from these people. For you're going to have a baby by Sarah, your wife. She was 65 years old and I was 75. She was about 25, 30 years past menopause. I married her. She's my half-sister. I married her when she's just a girl. And I, boy, 10 years difference in her age. And I married her. She became my wife. We'd lived together all these years. And she was barren and I was sterile. And yet, being a prophet, the word of the Lord came to me and said, You will bear a child by Sarah. And when I told Sarah that, she went out town and got some yarn and made the booties and got the pins ready and everything. And 28 days passed. I said, how are you feeling, honey? He said, no different. But I held steady because I knowed it was a word of the Lord. <laughs> That's right. We went over to see the doctor and he run us out of the office. <laughs> An old man, 75 years old, and a woman, 65, would to have a baby. You know, when you take God at his word, regardless of what your condition is, he made the promise. And he said, I went to the doctor. And the doctor ran us out of the office. An old man like you that said, watch him, he's a little funny in his head, said, there's something wrong with the old fellow. And the scoffers began to walk around and said, Abraham, where is that son that you was going to have by Sarah? After the first month, there's nothing wrong with her, so they tell me. The first year passed, nothing happened. Uh, Abraham, father of nations, how many children do you have now? Ten years passed, still no different. Scoffers. Mr. Impatient, he kept pointing his finger at me. See, there's nothing to it. Well, if there's something to it, you'd have that's 10 years ago. You are to have that baby in 10 years. But he said, I held steady because I was fully persuaded that what God said, God never told me when I was going to have that baby. He said, I would have it. But after 25 years, when I was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, the baby come on the scene. He's a very good witness. I waited 25 years. I never staggered at the promise of God by unbelief. And we claim to be Abraham's children and can't wait from one night to the other. This proves we're not. Right. Watch we get on the wrong side. See, he said, I waited 25 years. God didn't tell me next month Sarah's going to conceive. He said, you'll have the baby. And I was fully persuaded, no matter how old I got, and I know that I would see it happen because it was to be my child. Amen. Nothing's going to harm me. Old age, sickness, death, or nothing else can do it till that promise is fulfilled. And I staggered not the promise through unbelief. But every day when Sarah said, I feel a little better, I got stronger. Every year when she said, well, I didn't have it this year, then you'll have it this year. I didn't have it last year, well, I have it this year. That went on and on and on and on, year in and out for 25 years. And one day, I seen her turning back to a young woman. I began to see my strength coming. And the baby was born. 25 years later. The Lord never said when he would have the baby, but said he would have it. 
Abraham, I know you can testify a lot, but step down. I want another witness. All right, the defense witness now will call up his third witness. That'll be Moses. And Moses said, when I was born, I was born a prophet. He wants you to know that gifts and callings are without repentance. No matter how many books you read out of these stores, it says that, that God doesn't do that. The Bible still remains true. That gifts and callings are without repentance. You're born in this world what you are. And now notice, Moses, he had a sign to go down and show to the people. And there was a voice to follow that sign. Yet, when he went down with the God-given sign, I don't fail to get this, court. When he went down with this God-given sign that come from God, Pastor Pharaoh tried to, to smear his God-given gift by making him say it's magic. He had somebody who could do the same thing, some magician, and tried to make his God-given sign a cheap magic trick. All Pastor Pharaohs didn't die in that day. Some kind of mental telepathy, some kind of a power of Satan. And the thing of it was, they called up some cheap magicians and done the very same thing that he did. But he said, that didn't shake me. Because I know that the voice that spoke to me was a scriptural voice in that tree. He said, I have heard the cries of my people and I have seen their affliction and I remember my promise and the voice, although it was very odd in that day for a thing like that to happen, they had all kinds of magic tricks they could do. And God gave him something, a sign that looked like it was some kind of a cheap magician trick to try a servant. Oh, God. But he helped study because the voice that commissioned him was a scriptural voice. And he knew it was God. And you know we're promised that same thing in the last days? The same thing to repeat again? Um, Jambers and Jambers to come back to withstand the true thing when it's in operation. But their follies will be made known. So he tried to take some carnal impersonator. Somebody that tried, went around and tried to impersonate the gift that God gave him to make it look like it's some kind of a cheap outfit. But Moses wants you all to know this afternoon as he testifies that no matter how shady that the pastor tried to make his gift look like, that it was shady and some kind of a cheap magician trick. He knew it was the scriptures because it was the voice of God that told him and he stood firm. Amen. And he wants you to let you know that it was a long time after that, but God kept his word and brought him right back to the place to where he said he would come with the children of Israel. Moses stepped down, let the defense witness call another witness and we we're going to call Joshua. Joshua has a wonderful testimony here that he liked to give. He still the people, he said. When Moses called out one out of every denomination to send them over to, to the promised land to, to find out whether the land was really there or not. They'd just been told that. By faith, they'd walked that far. So Moses pulled out a Presbyterian, Lutheran, Pentecostal and all. He got one of them out, each one, and took them over to the promised land. And when two of them come back with the evidence, you know what happened? The whole group began to doubt it. When they seen the opposition was so great. Amen. The other side was so great. Why well, they said we look like grasshoppers up the side of them. Them Amalekites and, and Hatites and so forth. And said that we, we, while well, we look like grasshoppers, we can't do it. And Joshua wants to testify. I still the people. Amen. He said, be still at Kadesh Barnea, the judgment seat. He said, keep still all of you. Let me bring your, this word to you. God told us down yonder through Moses and through or through uh, Abraham that this land was ours. He sent a pillar of fire among us that talked to our prophet here in a burning bush. And what this prophet has said has been true. Amen. And God told us he'd already give us the land. We are more than able to take it. Because it already belongs to us. He said, I still the people and God, I'm quiet. But you know what? It was 40 years Later, before they took the land. They were only about two days' journey from Kadesh. They'd been over in the promised land. May I stop here a minute? You Presbyterians, Methodists, and Baptists, are you Pentecostals? Fifty years ago, we'd have got the promised land. But you got to fussing among one another. 
making organizations out from one side and this and getting this and this and getting this and a new revelation instead of following the word. And now we've been 50 years this side the full promise. But remember, it was 40 years, but Joshua wants you all to know that God kept his word with a brand new generation. He took the promised land just as it was promised. Because he's still the people on the word of God to let them know that God made the promise. That this prophet they were following was not a false prophet. Because the things that he was doing was exactly with the scripture. No matter how falsely Pharaoh said it was. How falsely magicians tried to say it was. How that they could do the same thing and everybody do the same thing. Joshua, he wants you to know if there's a man in there who want to make an organization out of them. His name was Dathan. And he and Korah. And they raised up and said, there's more holy man than you. God never does deal with groups. It's individuals. He cannot change what God does the first time he has to ever remain that same one. Amen. Hey, look, God's first decision to save a man was by the shed blood of an innocent one. It's never changed. God never changes. We tried to build cities for him. We tried to build towers. We tried to educate him. We tried to denominate him. And we get further away all the time. It's the only one place that man can fellowship. That's under the shed blood of the innocent one. That's the only way we'll ever believe it. Only way we can get together is under the shed blood of the innocent. God never changes his way. God in no time ever did deal but with one individual. He won't save you because you're Methodist or because you're Pentecostal. He'll save you as an individual, not as a group. He never does do that. He saves individuals. One. Just one person he deals with. Moses cried before the Lord, and the Lord said, Separate yourself, Moses. I called you with this message, and he let the world swallow him up. So Joshua wants you to understand that also. Now, after Joshua steps down, we'll call another witness right quick, so it won't take too long. I want to call Isaiah. I could call hundreds, but I just call these couple more and then quit. Isaiah the prophet, he said, In my day, the Lord vindicated me as his prophet. And we know that the word comes to the prophet. And then everything that I said, God honored it and made it come to pass. From the little boy up, everything that was said come to pass. I was vindicated amongst the people as a prophet. And then one day, God gave me the most rational thing to say that I could think of. He said, a virgin shall conceive. I'm going to give him a super sign. I'll give Israel and the world a super sign. They want signs. So I'll give him a super sign. A virgin shall conceive. And me, being a vindicated prophet, making such a rational thing as that, but I know that it was God's voice. And you know, you might say this. Isaiah might testify to the court this afternoon and say this. That pretty near every virgin that was in Israel got baby clothes ready because she's going to be the girl had it. She was going to be the virgin. Every one of them got ready. And one of them know the next month she's going to conceive by the virgin. She's going to be a virgin conceived. Because Isaiah the prophet was a vindicated prophet. Whatever he said in the name of the Lord come to pass. And now he says the virgin's going to conceive. And the women got the little girls. My daughter will be that one. The other, this, this, the fair, she'll belong to this group. She'll belong to this group. She'll belong to that group. All these, every one of the daughters is going to have this baby. Because the prophet said it was. And that generation passed. Isaiah died. Promise didn't come to pass. But 800 years later, God didn't say when the virgin would conceive. He just said she'd conceive. Amen. He wants you to know that. That God didn't say in this generation or at this time or at a certain time or a certain thing, this virgin shall conceive. He has said a virgin shall conceive. It was 800 years later, but that virgin conceived. God keeps his word. Do you believe that? There's time for to do it. Now, I could call all kinds of defense witnesses here, with the defense witness, rather, to give witness. I could call people out of here. But if, if this court will pardon me, may I have the privilege of being the next witness? I'm not going to talk about Moses and something that happened back there or something that happened 50 years ago or something that happened 100 years ago or 500 years ago. I'm going to talk about something that happened now. I want, I believe and I want to be the next witness to testify today that the Word of God that's promised for this day, not the day of Moses, not the day of the disciples, 
Not the day of Luther. Not the day of Pentecost. Not the day of Methodist. But this day. I want to give witness to it on the stand. And if you'll pardon this personal thing, because it has to be a personal witness, and it must be true. Because I know who is the one we're defending, and he'll know whether it's truth or not. I believe that we're living in the last days. And the message of another day will not fit this day. It cannot. It's got to be the message for today. Not what it was ten years ago. The message for this hour. The message for this generation. The Word speaks it. And if the Word promises, there has to be something vindicated. And that's the reason they failed to receive Jesus when He first came upon the earth. Is because they were living under a tradition. And Jesus told them, said, search the Scriptures. They testify me. He said, we're Moses' disciples. He said, if you were Moses' disciples, you would believe me, for Moses wrote of me. Look in the Scripture. And those blind, traditional man, yet good man, holy man, no one could put a finger up on them. They were priests. They live an example. They were men that you couldn't put a finger on because if you did, they'd be stoned. They were good men. They were bound to be good men by law. And they were raised up from generation to generation. Their sons and grandsons and great-grandsons all had to be priests, Levites. And yet the man in them trainings that never know nothing else but seminary and the Bible and were so blind they failed to see him. Could it be possible that we enter that again? Remember the same scripture said we would. That's exactly right. Said we would do it. Now, as a personal testimony, sometimes we get things so set together that we're so starched on this that this is the creed, this is the thing we must do until we miss it a million miles. And I suppose we'll do the same thing because the Scripture said we would. Now, as something personal, don't let it reflect. I trust it just because I'm at the witness stand to this court. I believe that we're at the hour of the coming of the Lord. I believe that these earthquakes and things that we're having, this moon at the, uh, up here at the observatory and things, are watching this moon, a squirting, bloody-looking uh, eruption from the inside of it. Jesus said that the moon would be turned into blood and there'd be earthquakes all over the earth in them, in them days before He's coming. He claimed that the day would be setting just exactly the way it is. And I believe, court, I want to say something to you this afternoon, that I don't see one thing to hinder him from coming right now. That the world, if I had time, I could prove it to you, is setting perfectly, even by names and position, the way it's supposed to be setting when he comes. When is the hour? I know not. No one knows. But he said, when these comes to pass, look up. Israel's in her homeland. Everything's setting just exactly right. For his coming. Now, when I was a little baby, my people, of course, being Irish descent, perhaps we were formed a Catholic, but my father and mother didn't go to church at all. In a little mountain home up in the state of Kentucky, one morning, April the 6th, 1909, in a little old house that didn't even have any windows in it, just a little door like you let the light in, when the Lord Jesus permitted me to come to the earth, being the firstborn of my mother and father, her 15, my dad 18. And on a little straw tick, I guess you people around here never know what a straw tick was. But a, a, how many ever know what a straw tick was? Well, what part of Kentucky are you from? See? So then a straw tick on a little straw tick with a shuck pillow. That one little bed in the room, a one little room and a little kitchen was just about the whole thing together wouldn't be 20 feet all together. Little old log cabin, no floor at all. A table's made out of a stump. And there, in that little room, when Jesus Christ permitted me to come to the earth, I can only say this by testimony of my parents, which was not religious, but they didn't have no lights like we have here, not even a coal oil lamp. I don't know where you ever know what a grease lamp was or not. Take some lard and put it in a can. And put a little piece of flannel in it and light it and it'll burn. The light that early in the morning wouldn't show enough light to let mama see what I was, what it looked like. And they opened this little window on the side towards the east for some robins was sitting in the bushes out there singing as it's breaking day at five o'clock. 
And when they opened up the window, a pillar of fire, light, came moving through the window and come and hung over the little bed. My mother screamed. The midwife was there. We had no doctor. And the midwife was there. They didn't know what it was. About two weeks after that, I was carried up to a little Baptist church called Possum Kingdom. And the minister held me in his arms and dedicated me to God. The mountain people didn't know what to think about that. They, they told him they thought maybe mama was just out of her head or just thought that. Three years later, we come to Indiana. And Papa got a job. He was a rider breaking horses for the ranchers and farmers and so forth. He come out there to break some hackney ponies for a, a rich man named O.H. Wathen. Lives on the Utica Pike. He's a great owner of the colonels and also the R.E. Wathen Distillery and all them in Louisville and O.H. and R.E. And Daddy was breaking saddle horses for him. And then he got hurt. And he went to being a private chauffeur for him. And at the age of about seven years old, I'd entered school in one September afternoon. I hate to say this, but it, I'm on witness stand. Uh, my father, being a real Irishman, a strict Kentuckian, he made his own drinks. And I was packing water to this little still that he had. And couldn't go fishing. At the back of the pond, I was crying, packing water about a city block from a barn where the horses stayed. And I was packing water there to come up to cool the coils on that still for that night. And I sat down under a white poplar tree and was crying. A little dirty face, hair hanging down, corn cob under my toe, keeping a big stump, you know, going along like that, coming from school. And all the rest of the boys was out the old ice pond fishing. And I was sitting there crying. I thought, why do I have to do this? Them other children don't do that. And while it was, a noise came into that tree like a wind turning, like a whirlwind. And I got up and looked back and I'm on the witness stand, remember. There's a voice spoke from that. said, don't you never smoke or drink or defile your body. There's a work for you to do when you get older. It scared the life out of me. And I went on. Things began to happen. Things began to prophesy and take place. And now, when I was a little boy then, about seven years old, then about 17 years after that, I was I had become a minister, a Baptist preacher of the Missionary Baptist Church. Dr. Roy E. Davis ordained me as a, one of the local pastors. Give me right stand to the state to marry, bury, baptize, so forth. And uh, the Missionary Baptist Church burned down, which I was assistant pastor at the time. And Mr. Davis come back to Texas, which was of Davis Mountains and, and uh, down near Van Horn, Texas. That's where they come from. And so while he was gone, I started to take over the congregation, got a tent, and I began to preach in the city, just a boy preacher. And I had a baptismal service down on the river on 19 and 33, on the middle of June, about 16th or 18th of June. And standing out there, it had been so hot for weeks, uh, hadn't had no rain for two or three weeks, and the country is burning up nearly. And there's, I guess, around seven or 8,000 people on the bank. And I was walked out in the water with my 17th candidate to baptize. And when I baptized, started to baptize, I said, as I baptize thee with water, may the Lord Jesus. When I said that, something struck me and said, look up. And as I turned to look at it, the third time it said it, a place about uh, 15 feet square was churning up and down in them brassy skies. And down from there came that same pillar of light that come in when I was a little baby, that spoke to me in the burning bush, or the bush back there that day, and come into that bush, and come hung over thousands of people, newspapers packed it all across the nation, plumb into Canada, we got the clippings, mystic light appears over a local Baptist minister while preaching, or baptizing. And that voice came down and said, as John the Baptist was sent forth to forerun the first coming of Christ, so will your message forerun the second coming of Christ. How could it be so? How could it be so? It looked like it would be impossible. Then when he spoke a few days from that and said, and I begin to see these visions and things that always happen to scare me. My brethren said to me, said, that's of the devil, my Baptist brethren. Said, that's of the devil. I said, you know, I'll just be standing. And I said, the first thing you know, it'll go into like a trance-like or something. And I said, I'll see things that always happen. He told me 22 years before that bridge went across there, how far it would go across, when it would go across, and how many men would lose their lives. And it was perfectly every time. And some of them said, that's the devil. And I got away and started crying and praying one night. I said, Lord Jesus, you know my heart. I love you. 
Let me die. Don't let me have any, uh, the devil to have anything to do with me. I'd rather die than be a false witness of you. And it was at that time when this light returned again and showed me the scripture that in this day this thing's supposed to happen. Here it is laying right here in the scripture now. It's been 33 years since that time, but I'm a witness that it's the truth. I'm a witness of these things that is true. And may I call the, the attention of this scriptural blind prosecutor. Now, this is going to sound ridiculous. Scripturally blind, this prosecutor is. That in the book of St. Luke, the 17th chapter and the 30th verse, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now, you want to know where this is, man? And he's the same yesterday, day, and forever. You want to know where the nail scars and the prints and things? Any hypocrite could do that. The life of Christ returns in the form of the Holy Ghost. Not a nail scar, the, the corporal body sitting at the right hand of God to make intercessions. But the Holy Ghost has come to carry on His work. I want you to know St. John 14, 5. Jesus said, He that believeth in me the works that I do shall he do also. I want you also to know that John uh, uh, the 14, uh, 15th chapter says that I am the vine, ye are the branches. And how can the branches bear any other kind of a life or fruit than that was in the vine? How can you people say that the apostolic age ceased? Where do you get it? How can a vine come out and bear today, can go out and bear an orange, and this day bear a pumpkin? It would have to change its life. And in Malachi, the third chapter, God said, I am God and I change not. What he was then, he is today, and he always was and always will be. Amen. I want to call you the attention that the prosecutor is trying to tell you that he, he said, I was or I will be. But it's wrong. He said, I am Amen. the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. This prosecutor's misinterpreting the word. When Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world, in Mark 16 here, and to preach the gospel to every creature, how far? Ever, all the world, it never has reached it. Every creature, it never has reached it. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them to the end of the world. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I want you to also know that Peter... On the day of Pentecost, who had the keys to the kingdom, when he stood up in Acts 2 and 38, he said, Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you, to your children, and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. When did the apostolic age cease? There's a commission. All the world, every creature, everyone that believes. I want the court to understand that, that that's God's promise. I want you to also understand this blind interpreter to the people doesn't understand the scripture. He said here in Mark, the, the 17th chapter and the 31st, he said, as it was in the days of Sodom. Now go back. Jesus was referring to the same Genesis that we're referring to. In the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now go back and look what it was in the days of Sodom. Then see where we're at. And see what's supposed to happen now. In the days of Sodom, when Abraham, which was a type, uh, he, we only being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and heirs with him. According to the promise. Any of you in the court this afternoon knows that. Watch Abraham. He received all kinds of signs. Everything from a supernatural God in a form of a light going between sacrifice. He received him in a voice and so forth. But the last sign that Abraham received upon the hill from Sodom just before the Gentile world was destroyed was God himself in a form of a human being. You understand, court? There was three messengers came up to him. Three messengers. And he went out to meet them. Two of them, a modern old Robertson Billy Graham, goes down into Sodom and preached the gospel and blinded them with their gospel. But this one that sat back there that eat the flesh of a calf, drink the milk from a cow and eat bread. 
And Abraham washed his feet. And he sat there, a man. And he said, now remember, his name had been Abram a day before that. And it had been changed to Abraham. And Sarah had been changed to Sarah. And watch him what he says. Where is your wife Sarah? S-A-R-R-H. Abraham. A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Where is your wife Sarah? He said she's in the tent behind you. She hadn't come out like women today do. and have to show themselves. But she, she was in a tent behind. He said I'm going to visit you according to the time of life. And Sarah doubted it in her heart. And said within her heart, these things can't be. Because you see, as family relation had been far from them, he was 100 years old and she was 90. Said, me have pleasure in my Lord and him old too out there. How could it be? And this man with his back turned to the tent. Said, why did Sarah doubt saying these things can't be? And Abraham called him Elohim. If anybody knows what Elohim means, the all-sufficient one. God Almighty Himself manifested in the flesh. How did Abraham call him that? Because he seen that that man was the Word. Amen. Now the Hebrews, the fourth chapter in the twelfth verse says that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right. And when Jesus came and performed that miracle by discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart, they called him Beelzebub. But the word in those prophets always was able to foretell and to discern. Amen. That's the word for that day. That's what identified them as prophets. Amen. And remember, he promised that the world would be in that condition and would receive that sign again before his coming. Amen. Now notice, in Luke 17 here, he said, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man, when the Son of Man is being revealed. Will you pardon me for another minute? Let me open something to you here just a minute, court. Will you permit this as I'm a witness? Did you notice here? He never said when the Son of God is being revealed. He said Son of Man. Jesus come with three titles. Son of Man, Son of David, Son of God. All the same person. That's, it's just like the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Not three gods, one person. And three attributes of God. Now, see, just like I am three persons. I am to my wife, a husband. I am to my daughter sitting here, daddy. And my grandson sitting there, I am grandpa. Now, my wife only has claims on me as her husband. And my daughter here can't say husband because she's my child. My grandson cannot call me daddy, right? He has no claims on me as daddy. He might call me that, but it isn't so. He is my grandson, yet I'm the same person. It's God unveiling Himself, bringing Himself down so He can be. He was above in a pillar of fire, then He was manifested in His Son, Jesus Christ, and now revealed to us by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Watch, when He comes, you know what Son of Man means? Look at Ezekiel, the second chapter, and you'll find Ezekiel 2.1. Jehovah Himself called Ezekiel the prophet Son of Man. He called all the prophets Son of Man. And why then did Jesus call himself Son of Man because he had to come in the way that the prophets said he would come. Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15 said, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like me. And he come to reveal himself to the natural seed of Abraham as Son of Man. And they call it the work of a devil. So has a royal seed. That sounds harsh, but it's corrective in its love. The royal seed today has done the same thing. Try to call it middle telepathy or some devil. It's the Son of Man. Christ. That was Christ in Ezekiel. Christ in Moses. Christ in David. It was Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. What? The Word being made manifest by these prophets. Listen to it, court. Before you make your decision. The word comes to the prophet. Jesus said that your law says that your, at them the word of the Lord come to is God's. And Jesus admitted they were God's. He said then if you can call them and recognize them, your law is being God's who the word of the Lord come to the prophets. How will you condemn me when I say I'm the son of God? Amen. When he is the vindicated word of that hour. Amen. They said they believe the prophets and here was a word in fullness. 
and still they didn't believe it because they had their creed and their tradition. Watch now, court, before you make your decision. Let's go just a little farther. Watch. The son of man, they called him a devil. But they wanted to make him king, you know, by force. Look, when blind Barnabas ran after him and said, Thou son of David, have mercy. He got what he asked. But when the Syrophian woman, a Greek, Gentile, ran after him and said, Thou son of David, he never even raised his head. She had no claims on him as son of David. He was no son of David to her. But when she said, Son of God or Lord, which is Son of God, she got what she asked for. See, the Gentiles have no claim on him as son of David. He was king. He's Lord to us. And when he revealed himself as son of man, as the scripture said he would be, no, sir, they rejected it. He wasn't no prophet. They couldn't believe it. They hadn't had one for hundreds of years. And they couldn't believe him to be a prophet. When he told the little woman about how many husbands she had, and her in that condition, she was ordained to life. She said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. I know when Messiah cometh, we haven't had a prophet for hundreds of years. But I know when he comes, that's a sign he'll do, because he'll be the word. He knows what's in my heart. He said, I am he that speaks to him. And her testimony caused the whole city to come to Christ. Right? They all believe. Now look, as son of David, he was with the Jew, but the son of God. Now look, son of man, prophet. See? Son of David, king. They recognized it. Not a prophet. They want to make him king. They wanted to be delivered out from under the Roman Empire. But then in the church age, he's called the son of God. Now, anyone knows that God is a spirit. Is that right? Amen. And the Holy Ghost is the Son of God. It's supernatural. Son of man was a prophet, a man. David was a king. But God is a spirit. And in the church age, he's revealed as Son of God. We believe that. If you don't believe he's the Son of God, you're lost. He's the Son of God to the church age. But bear me record. The seventh church age, which is the latest sea of church age. Will we admit that this is the latest sea of age? Amen. Remember, he, the word, was put out of the church. Is that right? Amen. Put out of the church. And he was on the outside trying to get back in. I stand and knock at the door. And you say that I'm rich and I have need of nothing. And knowest thou not that you're miserable, blind, naked, wretched and don't know it. He was on the outside the word. What is it? Our traditions. Our Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal traditions has rejected the word. And it can have no cooperation nowhere. Everybody's hands off of it. And want to call it an evil spirit. And do you understand that Jesus said in the last days before the coming of the end time that he would be revealed again as son of man. Not son of God. And that fulfills Malachi 4 and all these other promises of Abraham. The last sign that Abraham received, he was waiting for a coming son. And the last sign that he was received was God revealed in a human being. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the son of man. Now, Will you forgive me for me to make a little deep statement here? I want to ask you theologians something. Search back through the scripture, through Bible history. As you've been telling me this week, you're a, you're a scripture reading man. And also that you was, that the apostolic age is finished. And, and that, there, that you know all the history of the church. I want you to call this to your attention. God forgive me for breaking this out. If it's not right to do it. The world is setting exactly time for it. The world never was in such a time as this, as in a Sodom condition. Last week, in Florida, the state of Florida, 60-something percent of the school teachers was put out of the school for homosexual. 40-some-odd percent increased over California over last year, homosexual. The schools, the seminaries, everything is full of it. And she's setting exactly where it was in the days of Sodom. God will be obligated if he don't punish this nation and this world for our sins. He'll be morally obligated to raise up Sodom and, and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them. Look at the hour we're living. Think now a minute, court, before you make your decision. 
Now, Jesus never said in the days when the Son of God will be revealed. He was revealed in the church age, but the church has put him out. Then he would be revealed as Son of Man. When the Son of Man is being revealed, God manifested amongst the human beings like it was then. Son of Man, prophetic. Malachi 4 is promised a, a seer to come forth with a voice. Not Malachi 3 now. Say my message. Malachi 4. Mal don't get them confused because you do, you'll miss it. Malachi 4 was not Malachi 3. I say my message before my face, but Malachi 4, when this messenger comes, the world is to be burned and the millennium sets in the wicked is burned as ashes and the righteous walk out upon the ashes. That never happened in the days of John. Amen. See? Malachi 4. And watch, there's to be a sign. And that sign must be a scriptural sign. Amen. Jesus said, I come from God. I go to God. He was the pillar of fire that was in the burning bush. They stood there one day and said, you're a man not over 50 years old. He might have looked a little older than he was, really was. His ministry is heavy. And the Bible says there's no beauty we should desire. And probably a little bitty fellow. He said, you say you're not over 50 years. We are not over 50 years old. Say you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I come from God. I was that pillar of fire in the wilderness. I come from God. He's made flesh, the son of God. God overshadowed a virgin, created a blood cell, it brought forth his son, which God housed in that son. God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. And I go to God. After his death, burial, and resurrection, Saul was on his road down to Damascus and was stricken down by a light, that pillar of fire. You think that Jew would call anything some, some kind of a, an illusion? Lord, when he looked up and seen that pillar of fire, he knew that's what he, his, Followers that follow, followed out of Egypt. He said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. He's the same yesterday day and forever. And the scriptural voice that spoke in Moses' bush. And Moses stood pat on it. So was that a scriptural voice that spoke in the bush at seven years old. I still stand and say it's the truth because Moses seen that word had to come to pass. I see this word has to come to pass. The Son of Man has to be revealed. Exactly what it said. Notice, it promised that. It's not Son of God, Son of Man. See, Son of Man, Son of David, and Son of God. But after the days of the church age, when he's put out, then he reveals himself again as son of man. Because we being dead in Christ, we take on Abraham's seed and we are his royal seed. How many admit that? That the church is his royal seed. Well, you see what he did to Abraham? He's doing the same thing. Now, pardon this. Now, you fellows that say you know history so well. Tell me when in the history of the church has there ever been a leader that went to you? Out there with you Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever you might be. When was there a man sent to you with the ending of his name with H-A-M until now? G-R-A-H-A-M. You had Sankey's, Moody, Finney, Knox, Calvin, but never a H-A-M like Abraham. And G-R-A-H-A-M is only six letters. A-B-R-A-H-A-M is seven letters. God's word, perfected. Now, remember this person that was in the days of Abraham. Now, Abraham was, he was the elected. He wasn't in Sodom. He was called out of Sodom. That messenger that visited him never went to Sodom. But the ones went down to Sodom. Watch what they did. Watch what this one did to the church elected. And Jesus called your attention to the same thing would happen in the last days. When the Son of Man would reveal Himself in human flesh. The Word, knowing the secret of the heart. As it said, it's a more powerful than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts like all the prophets did. Like Jesus did Himself as called Beelzebub and rejected here again in the last days. I wonder if that blind interpreter ever thought of that. I wonder if you ever realized that these scriptures that's been prophesied for this day has to come to pass. How many do you believe it must be at this time? At God's word, though it linger, yet all these things, these church ages pass, and it's been hundreds of years since we've ever had it, but it's promised to be here. He's revealed himself as Son of God, Son of God, the Holy Ghost baptized, the Pentecostal church and the churches down to him has brought down signs, wonders, miracles like he did. They've seen God in great visions and everything, but never has a church ever seen the Son of God manifested. In human flesh that would reveal the thoughts that's in the heart. Amen. Till this age. And that was the age that seen Sodom burn and the promised son return. 
I wonder if that blind interpreter of the scripture ever thought of that. I want the court to remember that. Remember, no longer how, no matter how much it lingers, yet it's got to happen. It's going to happen. These witnesses testify, has absolutely testified the truth. That it is so. God said they shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. But the outside world wants you to believe as soon as you lay hands on you must the crippled legs must be straightened. You must jump up and down. He never said that. He never promised that. He said the prayer of faith shall save the sick and God will raise them up. He never said when. They lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. He never said when. He said, when you pray, believe it, you receive it, and it shall be given to you. He didn't say when. Now, if we are real, genuine believers, when these scriptures are ministered to us, there's nothing can tell us any difference. There's nothing can say that it's wrong. How many could raise up? How many infidels? How many unbelievers? How many could explain this, that, or the other? God keeps His Word. And Mark 16 is just as inspired as John 3, 16. Amen. The whole thing's the Word of God. Every word of it's inspired. Amen. All of it is God. If you just read it the way it says. I want to call the church to the order of the day to find out before you call anything a devil, you better remember the promise of this is to be in this day. Amen. See? Remember that. Because one word against the Holy Ghost is never forgiven in this world, neither in the world to come. And you see the Holy Spirit Himself manifested doing the same thing. I'm looking at a little woman sitting here in front of me. I think she's a Presbyterian, I'm not mistaken. I was at my house not long ago. She had to Wednesday to live. Cancer. <laughs> sitting in the room. I just happened to spot her sitting by a friend of mine. And she... It was given to Wednesday to live by the medics of the city. They're a puzzle now. Here she sits tonight looking fine and healthy and still living. You're thankful for it, aren't you, sister? <laughs> Raise your hand if that's right. She's just sitting right here. Dying and given to Wednesday about several months ago. And now the doctors are amazed to think, what happened? It was thus saith the Lord. His words are still true. When this scripture says here that these signs shall follow them and believe, if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. If you believe, these signs shall follow the believer. They shall, he never said when. And if you're a real believer, there's nothing could separate you from that. Listen to Abraham's testimony. Listen to the rest of their testimonies. How many hundreds could I call on the scene today and show you that God keeps his word? Regardless, if you believe it and stand there and know in your heart that it's going to come to pass. When this little lady referring to, uh, somebody was telling me a few minutes ago, excuse me, was telling me a few minutes ago, coming through the dinner line out there, said, Brother Brandon, you remember this little lady here? Your prayer of faith to her not long ago, she was years ago, was dying with a cancer. Is that woman sitting present? Somebody pointed her out to me. Said, raise up your hand if you are sitting here somewhere. A little woman coming through the line, some man, gray-headed brother, was pointing her out to me. Said, she was dying with cancer, and here she lives now. Is that lady in the building here now? She was in the dinner room a while ago. Part of, there, yeah, yeah, there's Mrs. Waldorf back there. That was staying dead in the line. Fifteen years ago. Seventeen years ago. With her doctor, with the, with the x-ray there, the cancer had eaten her heart out. But it was thus saith the Lord. Let the critics rise and say what they want to. I'm a witness that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was then, he is today. He's not I was, I will be. He is now present tense. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus and his word is the same. And he is the word. Do you believe it? What did he say? These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Before we say this to court, you are the jury. You've heard the case. How many witnesses could we call? No matter how many other witnesses uh, the prosecutor could call, these words testify against him. He misinterpreted the scripture. How many believes that the words are true? How many is believer? Raise up your hand. All right. The Bible said this. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now look, each one of you, through this broken up little message, 
you've drawn some conclusion. Down in your mind, you've made up your mind. Because that's a jury. And the way you act from hereafter, that'll prove what your verdict is. <laughs> See? The way you live from hereafter will prove just what your verdict is. Now, if you go out and say, well, I'm just as sick as I was when I come in. Uh, it shows just what kind of a verdict you've made in this court this afternoon. I think he's had a fair trial. He's had been brought up as the Word. He's been proved as the Word. He's been identified as the Word. If I die this night, the words that I've said is true. The world knows it. The scientific world knows it. That same pillar of fire. The same angel of the Lord. How many seen the picture of it? It hangs in Washington, D.C. The only supernatural being was ever photographed. If I die this night, I never see again what I've said is the truth. And God has testified of it that it's the truth. And here's the scripture says it's supposed to be now. Then call it a devil if you want to. That'll be between you and God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's identifying himself as he promised. Much more could be said in this last days as son of man. Making himself known among his people in the form of his people. Not son of God. Not son of David. But son of man. The Son of God was a supernatural. Like Abraham, he seen voices and heard things and seen lights and so forth. But just before the promised Son come, God revealed Himself as a man in human flesh and read the thoughts that was in Sarah's heart in the room behind Him. How many says those? That's the Scripture. Very good. And He said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of God, coming uh, when the Son of Man shall be being revealed. The Son of Man being revealed. Not the Son of God in the church age. He's put out of that. Now He's Son of Man revealing Himself. The Word is becoming flesh among us. Oh, my friend, open your eyes, court, before you make your decision. Make your decision and believe it with all your heart. He's justified in rightness in the Scripture. He's justified in what He says. I can prove it. I know He's right. God does prove it. He needs nobody to interpret say this is that and this is that. He says He'll do it and He does it and that settles it. He's His own interpreter. You believe that? Amen. How many is believers then? Raise up your hand and say, I am a believer. I want every believer in here to stand to your feet. Unbeliever, remain seated. Believer, stand to your feet. In this court, before it adjourns, I want to thank the Lord that this court has made up its mind. The jury has come to this verdict that Jesus Christ is justified in putting these things in His Word. When it's truly interpreted in the light of the Word, it is the truth. How many of you, court, believe that? Raise your hand and say, Before God, I believe it, it's the truth. I believe it, it's the truth. Now, how many, would you put your hand down, say, I am a believer in what you've said. I believe it to be the honest truth. It's the Word of God. Raise up your hand. All right. Now, I want you to reach right across the table and lay your hand on another believer. Put your hand right across the table and lay it on another believer. Are we believers? What did he say? These signs shall follow them, I believe. Court, have you made up your mind? Say amen. amen. My verdict has been reached. Is that right? Amen. amen. That the word of God is true. Amen. amen. Mark 16 is true. Amen. amen. Then these signs shall follow them, I believe. They have to recover. He said so, did he not? Amen. Now, the way you pray at church, you pray for the person you got your hands on there praying for you. And these signs shall follow them that believe. What will happen? Your action from this hour on will prove what your true verdict is. Now bow your head, every one of you. Now pray for the person that you got your hands on. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I call this to your attention again. These men and women have claimed by their testimony that they are believers. They have stood and they are laying their hands on one another. Lord, we believe your word. That in this great day of education, this great day of, of, of going on, of ethics and, and all the educational systems, yet in the midst of all of it, your word remains true, just the same. And we call witnesses in this court this afternoon, Lord, to give you a fair trial, not a mock trial, not a mock like Herod give you or, 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 or one of the others. We're giving you a fair trial here and proven and your people has made up their mind that the Word of God in 1964, this hour that we're now living, that you're just as much God as you ever was and every word that you promised is the truth. And they've got their hands laying on one another as believers. They're praying for one another. And you said, these signs shall follow them that believe. 
If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. You never said when. You said they shall recover. Now, them being, as I being the moderator, and these people being the jury, also the judge, they have given witness to this, Lord, by moving to one another's hands and praying for one another. Now, their actions hereafter will certainly prove what their verdict is. May there never be one complaint among them anymore of ever being sick, of this sickness or whatever bothers them now. May they know that God promised He would do it. Sometimes it lingers that He did in the days of Noah. He did in the days of Moses. He did in all days. But He, he never told the Pentecostal people, go up to the city of Jerusalem in 24 hours, I'll give you the Holy Ghost. He said, tarry there until you're endued with power from on high. He never said one day, two days, ten days. He said, stay until you're endued with power. Lord, they stayed until the evidence spoke that to them. It, it was the Holy Ghost of God. Now, may these people who has their hands up on one another, who stands this court this afternoon in the presence of God, in the presence of His Word as I've read it, and we testify to this that we believe that He keeps His Word. And may each one be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now all you that believe that from this hour that a believer that stood to their feet as a believer and you a believer that you've testified and give witness before this court this afternoon that you believe that he's just and he keeps his word. No matter how long it tarries, it's got to happen. Do you believe it? Raise your hand. Do you accept it? God bless you. I believe it with all my heart. Now let us bow our heads just a moment. Is there a person in here that's been an unbeliever? A person that's not a Christian? I want to give you the opportunity to walk up here to this before this court and make a confession and say, I have been a doubter all my life. But from this day on, I accept Jesus Christ. I know that the Bible said that in the days as it was in the days of, of Jonah, was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights. They said to him, give us a sign. He said, a wicked and an adulteress. A Sodom generation seek after a sign and they'll get it. They'll get a sign for as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and night. So must the son of man be in the heart of the earth. These disciples that we read about was misunderstanding when they wouldn't believe those who had seen him after he has risen from the dead. We've seen him. We know that it's true. He is risen from the dead. We believe it. And we're living in a days like it was in the days of, of Jonah. When the cities were perverted into evil. And Jonah come forth out of the whale's belly as one from the dead. And today we believe Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And is making himself known down through the church age as son of God. And now fully fulfilling his promise in the last days to reveal himself to Abraham's royal seed as son of man. God bless you. With our heads bowed now quietly and reverently. While we sing one verse, I love him, I love him because he first loved me. And if you're a, not a Christian and you want to become one and to take your stand tonight with the Lord's despised few in this evil day like it was in the days of Noah, like it was in the days of Sodom, come forth while we sing with our heads bowed and everybody praying. I Keep our heads lowly now as we hum. Mm. Think of it. Think of it. Can you shake yourself just a little bit? The very God that made the promise is here making it known. Right on earth today. Proving it. Here's the scriptures. Nobody has to interpret it. It's already interpreted. And he purchased my salvation. Would you accept it? Now, 
If you're already a Christian and you'd like to live closer to God, let's raise your hands while we sing it again with our heads bowed. Want a closer walk with God? You believe this to be the truth that we're living in the last days. God be with you, friend. Don't fail. Don't fail. Believe Him. I love Him. Mean it with all your heart now. Surrender yourself. He is the Word. The Word for this day. 